Hello and welcome to another Watch Pro original. Um, my name is Rob Corder, I'm the founder and editor of Watch Pro. And today I'm delighted to say we're joined by um, two giants of the British watchmaking industry. Um, Mike France, who is the uh, co-founder and chief executive of Christopher Ward, probably one of the most successful uh, British companies making watches today. And Roger Smith, who is widely considered to be uh, this country's greatest living uh, watchmaker. Uh, and they're here to discuss um, the creation of a new association called the Alliance of British Watch and Clockmakers, which is aiming to um, put British watchmaking on the map and um, you know, really try to light a fire under it uh, in, a commercial in a commercial sense. So, um, Let's see what they have to say as we as we welcome them in. Um, so yeah, I mean this is the the, the, um, the the British Watch and Clockmakers Association. What, what what can you tell me about it? What why why do we need this? Uh, well, we can, we, 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 well, we can we can the first the first thing is we'd like you to call it by its proper name, Rob. <laughs> Okay. The Alliance, Alliance of Alliance British Watchmen Clock Makers. Yeah. I was reading it from your logo. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's an important name, I think, because um, we do want it to be an alliance, don't we, Roger? And, um, Definitely. We, we chose the word carefully and avoided things like association, that sort of thing, because um, we don't want to, uh, we, we certainly don't want to be considered to be draped in ermine, um, because this is very much a sort of a, um, we hope a modern forward-looking um, trade association of its type um, and so uh, yeah uh, the launch is uh, is this week but we, you know Roger can talk to you about the sort of aims we've got but its genesis was uh, really in a, a conversation that Roger and I had when we bumped into each other at uh, in I think it was November 2018 mm. uh, we were walking around the the very last as it turned out uh, Salon QP show which was uh, very disheartening, I think. I mean, we were, was, we were, we were feeling quite deflated, I think, Roger, when we, we walked around the show. Definitely. And yet we knew that um, there was a huge amount of positivity in the, um, in, in the watch and clock making sector in the, in the UK. You know, I mean, if, we, if you look back 15 years or, or more, you know, there, there was virtually nobody, I mean, other than Roger, um, and George Daniels at that time, sort of um, making doing anything really in the UK. You fast forward to you know 2018 and now, and the industry is unrecognisable from from what it was then. And yet there didn't seem to be any real understanding that this was a sector. You couldn't go anywhere to find out anything about this sector, um, apart from reading you know great organs like your own. Um, there was nothing nothing tangible and we sort of i think just just decided i mean one of those sort of serendipitous moments i think we just decided well somebody needs to do something about it and in the absence of anybody else um showing any inclination well we may as well um <laughs> and, and um so it's been a been, you know so since then i think you know roger um really sort of set the thing off um he called me i think it was about february in 19 roger mm. wasn't it? And the, yeah yeah uh, and, and the whole thing started to gain momentum from them really okay so do you want to tell me a little bit a bit, a bit about the aims then roger certainly yes i mean it's um well as mike said we're hoping to um get this british watch and clock maker sector recognized and uh, recognised as an entity in its own self, so recognised by government, um, recognised by the collecting community, recognised by people who don't know anything about British watch and clock making, and to try and bring them into this fascinating world of British watch and clock making, which has been, as Mike said, flourishing now for oh, over 10 years now. Um, but also it goes deeper at that. Our first, um, well, the first thing that we are, are, are doing and we've already instigated it is to um, 
find out what's going on in British watch and clock making. So from a financial perspective, mm. so we've commissioned KPMG to, um, to start building a bellwether report into the status, status of British watch and clock making. And um, because obviously in order to move forward, you need to know where we are today. And there are no figures anywhere that you can look into to tell you how many employees are in the industry, how many uh, watches and clocks are being made, how many watches and clocks are being sold domestically and also are exported around the world. Mm. What sort of size and value is this industry, this sector? I mean, we think it'll be, we think, well, who knows, it could surprise us. We've already discovered that there are over 50 companies in the UK, but we just need to find out the size of and scope of these companies. And then we can start to build from there. And what we'd like to do, if we can all work together, is to build on that. And how can we, I mean, th there are many, many goals and it's going to take many years to implement some of these goals, but basically we want to um, encourage British supply chain um, you know, so an example I've always talked about is, is um, or a good example is, let's say this bellwether report discovers that within Britain we make 60,000 watches, let's say, which could be possible. You never know, because there are so many different companies at so many levels that have kind of are off the radar at the moment. Suddenly you've got... Uh, knowledge that 60,000 cases need making in Britain. And so, you know, then we can go to engineering companies and talk about this and say, look, we've, uh, we've got the need in Britain for 60,000 cases. Now, um, 10,000 of those may be precious metal cases, maybe even 5,000, we just don't know. Um, you know, 30,000 could be in the 150 pound to 300 pound mark. You know, there's a whole scope of information that we can then start talking sensibly to engineering and saying, look, we need cases making. There's enough work there for somebody to set up and start making cases. And that for me is exciting. One of the many exciting things that we will be able to do with this information we're going to uh, gather from the industry. And that could be the start of a case making company within Britain. Mm. We already know that Bremont are successful in making their own cases on a, on a reasonable scale. Uh, we, we make 13 to 14 cases a year. Um, so case making is happening, but wouldn't it be great if several makers can get together and encourage an engineering company to start making more cases, more locally produced cases. Mm. And, this thing is going to take a, a hell of a lot of work, but I think it's all achievable given time and you know the right sort of enthusiasm for people. So have I missed anything there, Mike? Are there more things we can be doing? No, well, no, it's a really important, uh, important aspect of what we're trying to achieve. And I think the, um, again, back to the point Roger makes about the Bellwether Report, that gives, um, it gives a scope and a scale to an industry. It, it sort of, says we're an industry if you like um, it's a it's a it's a benchmark um, and um, there, there really isn't one that exists today um, I remember being uh, Roger was at the same meeting there was a meeting at Watford's uh, Watford's um, football ground uh, many years ago now five six seven years ago and uh, then somebody um, somebody said in the audience you know why do we not know anything think about this sector that we're in and the reason is nobody had ever pulled any information together so information is power um, not our power but it's power that will hopefully power this alliance forward and the sector forward and you know one of the things that um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm Roger are very keen to do is to encourage people to join the sector to think of it as a, uh, a you know a genuine place for employment across any number of disciplines including watchmaking including case making whatever it may be but it also includes all of the business acumen um you know sort of uh, sectors as well whether that be marketing or sales or whatever mm -hmm. and um again 
we want to promote the industry as a place that can employ people that you know we are roughly that varies but um, some people reckon we are as a nation a hundred thousand or more engineers light of what of where we need to be as a nation to to drive the economy forward now you know at its basis level you know watchmaking is is engineering it it, ha it happens to be the most precise engineering man's ever created um, and it's a fantastic stepping um, stone into into all sorts of engineering but nobody would ever think of it as an engineering sector um, and there's very few students studying watchmaking in the UK we'd like to give those um, the organizations that do educate people um, you know again encouragement to grow for more people to apply to become watch, uh, involved in the watch industry etc so it, it is as roger says it's, it's it's about trying to bring people together to give um to give people knowledge to show that this thing exists and to to demonstrate what a wonderful sector it is because nearly everybody who comes into the sector like me from never being involved in it when it touches you, it touches you deep because it's such a rich sector. Uh, and I think it's, you know, if you go back 200 years or more, you know, Britain dominated. Um, we, we, we've lost that. Uh, I'm not sure if, well, I, you know, it's going to take an awful long time. And I'm not even sure we ever will get back to where we were in terms of dominance in the world. But then we're an incredibly innovative nation. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that it's unlikely that we'll ever be the world's greatest automotive sector ever again. You know, we have Formula One, which leads the way. And in some ways, you know, trying to encourage um, that sort of um, innovation in the watch sector um, is, is part of what we'd like to try and achieve. And this is not a, you know, we're not, we're not uh, naive. We know that this is not a short term goal. You know, none of these aims are going to happen overnight, but certainly Roger and I are in it for the long run um and uh and and you know we want people to to join us so that you know the journey can be enjoyed um by as many people as possible really but when, when you when you set up do this bell, bellwether report and you expect to identify about 50 companies which sounds entirely entirely plausible to me but what are the what are the parameters going to be I mean, what what makes a british watch and clock maker and christopher ward for example you own your own Manufacturing in Switzerland, Vermont is definitely bringing stuff back, but is still predominantly, um, you know, Swiss based Swiss sourcing. I mean, is, is that not true of forty eight out of the fifty companies you're going to find? Yeah, today it's, it certainly is true. Um, in fact, we I think Roger, we've identified even more, haven't we now? Um, yeah, we think so. Yes, close, close yes. to maybe seventy five. Is it? I think we've uncovered, but um, mm. but yes. Um, Sorry, or did you want to do you want to answer that? No, no, carry on. No, no. Um, yeah, no. I mean, I think the um, we recognise that uh, virtually that, that that there is very little um, real watchmaking goes on in the UK at the moment. Um, we want to encourage more of it. That's a, a long term goal to become. Uh, but there are you know up to seventy five brands um, who. Um, who essentially operate out of the British Isles. You know, they're, they're based in the British Isles. They may be sourcing from overseas um, components. They may be making some of the components themselves and may be assembling in the UK, but largely a large part of what they, they do is, 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 is sourced from overseas. Um, we, for instance, uh, as you say, we have our own, um, our own atelier in, in Switzerland. Um, if we could find um, the quality at the price that we need, down the road from us in Maidenhead, um, we would love to be <laughs> producing watches and and uh, and, and using um, more components from the UK. And that is a very long term goal of ours. I mean, but as I say, it's not a it's not something that's going to happen. Maybe even in you know my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it can't start, and it doesn't mean it can't grow from the base it's at. Um, and it isn't essential for people to um, be making. The thing is that these are British companies, yeah? They're British brands. And one of the things that we do bring as a nation is, is you know, a provenance about branding. And the British brand itself is not something, um, you know, to be sniffed at. And taking that Britishness in watchmaking 
to the world um, is something is another one of the aims we have, you know, to actively promote British brands, whether they are made wholly made in the UK, partly made in the UK, or just using component parts from elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, but based in the UK as a British brand, they are all equal uh, under the alliance. There is no sort of hierarchy. All we want to do is promote great British brands in watchmaking to the rest of the world. And I, and I think, um, I mean, if, if you, it, when, when you talk about what, you know, the way the industry, I mean, basically it's a reflection of where we are today in Great Britain. You know, there is no doubt that the vast proportion of movements, cases and dials and so on are imported from Switzerland, China and, you know, further afield and so on. But that's a true reflection of where we are and we've got to embrace that and work with that. And, um, and also we've got to acknowledge that uh, importing has always been part of the British watch and clock making scene. You know, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Rebecca Struthers talk on, um, on this very sort of issue, which was going back to the sort of 17th century where uh, the Swiss were making English fake watches. <laughs> and um, I think this is often a, a long forgotten part of our history. You know, we had the great watchmakers and, um, you know, they sort of set the watchmaking and clockmaking scene with all their great innovation and so on. But behind the scenes, we were importing um, watches, you know, in vast quantities into mm. uh, Britain. And um, so we've got to embrace that, you know, this is where we are today and we've got to try and, you know, build on that. And as Mike says, if we can bring some manufacturing back, we know it's possible, um, then wouldn't that be a great thing to do? You know, as, and again, just to touch on Mike, you know, there are so many aspects, uh, so many different fields within horology, the supporting trades around horology. Absolutely. It's such an exciting, um sort of sector and there's so much room for so many different trades and skills to support you know the end sort of builder of watches and clocks it's 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 very exciting and one that um is clearly growing i mean we again nobody really knows yet and hopefully the bellwether report will give some indication of the level of growth but there can't be many sectors um, in current industrial Britain that are growing as fast as the watchmaking sector. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Coming from virtually nothing, you know, 10, 15 years ago to 75 companies now is, is, is no small achievement, really. Um, mm -hmm. And it isn't widely understood and recognised. So it's a, it's mm -hmm. a fast growing um, um, sector. And politically right at the moment, um, it seems apposite that, um, you know, that we, we celebrate and promote that which we're good at, um, uh, certainly post-Brexit. And, and I think one of the, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to have Alistair Audsley um, as, the, uh, as the sort of chief exec of, uh, of, of the Alliance, who, who's worked with Roger for a number of years. Um, and, and, and Alistair is, is, you know, is an, an ambassador for the great campaign. Um, and uh, we know, because we've had conversation with government, um, that they are incredibly supportive of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and looking, and, didn't, and they, they themselves did not know that the sector existed. They did really not understand that there was a sector in this country that was watch, watching clock making. So, you know, that, that alone was a win. <laughs> um, and they're very, very keen to promote it. Uh, and we're very keen to act as a sort of a conduit. The Alliance is very keen to act as a conduit to help British brands be promoted as widely as possible. Uh, and if, if that's with government support, then all the better, really. Um, I, guess, I guess you could divide this into sort of short-term short goals. In, in the alliance of this type, we'll, we'll need some short-term goals so that you can measure it against, you know, have you achieved, have you achieved anything in the, in the first couple of years? And that, I suppose, is going to be partly to do with what you talked about as aspects already in sales, marketing, branding, design. These are, these are you know, real strengths that Britain has, and they can be applied to the watchmaking industry. You might look at 
apprenticeships, you might look at um, watchmaking schools and in investments in, into those sorts of areas, and that could get some um, momentum going. But then I suppose a longer term, and this, you know, if I had to guess, could take decades, you know, are we going to have a glass shooter equivalent, you know, exactly. somewhere in the, in the south of England? I mean, that would, that would be a, a lofty ambition, but perhaps achievable um, yeah. in, in 10, 20 years. Is that roughly the sort of programme you might be looking at? It is, definitely. Yeah. I mean, don't forget the north of England. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no. I mean, you are right. I, I have a close relationship with Birmingham City University and also um, the Manchester School of Watchmaking. And um, at the moment, there's no, there, there's not a huge amount of dialogue between the people who are, you know, running these companies and these educational um, bodies and. Um, I mean, of course there is, but, you know, again, what we want to do is through this Bell the Weather with report is we'll be able to then report to these um, educators and say, look, we need 10 more watchmakers at a certain standard as a certain level, you know, and, you, you know, we'll be able to work with them to develop the skills that we are needed, needing in this current climate. And um, of course, yeah, it, it's about feeding everyone, isn't it, Mike? And um, it is. yes, it who knows where we'll end up? But we're, you know, we're of the mind that we just want it to gradually build and build, and you know, we'll go as far as we can with this. Yeah, and we and we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't forget either the um, the potential that you mentioned earlier, Roger, for people to become interested in collecting British watches, yeah. which can have a really powerful impact on the retail sector of watches as well in this yeah. country. You know? um, and we've got some really interesting thoughts and ideas um, about how that might be done. But again, to, to bring a knowledge to potential collectors uh, of all different types of watches at all different price points um, could easily, lead, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a watches of Switzerland <laughs> but there isn't a watches of Britain mm. and there isn't even a sort of a watches of Britain as a subset of a watches of Switzerland if you're with me yeah. and I think again once you start collating information and gathering these elements together these disparate elements together you begin to form something and some of this is you know this will say that we have you know no sort of um clear plans about where some of these strands will lead. But I do know enough to know that when you assemble data of this sort, and um, when it's presented to people in the right way, um, unexpected things come out of it um, because um, people are really sort of, um, for the first time, seeing the possibilities of promoting and growing things that they didn't know exist. So I would say information is, is, is really important if you're going to drive something forward. And so the first short-term goal is to really begin to collate information that then acts as a springboard to, to other activities. But there's also a, um, a social side of this as well and an information, but you know, we've, 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 we've already established a number of, there will be, as you will know only too well, Rob, than virtual in the first uh, instance, but open dial sessions, um, you know, knowledge drops, where on a regular basis, probably quarterly to begin with, um, where, you know, people involved in the industry and people who are just interested in the industry can come together and listen and hear, you know, um, uh, expositions about certain sectors of the industry. Again, part of this, and I know this is a real passion of Roger's, this, the sharing of knowledge yeah, across companies, across individuals, uh, is just a really sort of underpinning part of what we're about. It's trying to give people the opportunity of sharing information, of gleaning information, and then using it. Um, and I, I just know that we've got more talent in this sector now than at you know probably any time since the 1700s in many ways mm. and armed with good information armed with opportunity even beyond that which they've got now um you know and the alliance can be just one you know but we hope an important element in helping to 
give platforms to people to grow. So the, the overriding drive for this entire alliance is growth. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's just about growing this fantastic sector of ours. I mean, it sounds, mm. sounds like you've got a, a, a sort of commercial um, slant on what you're doing. You don't just want it to be a, a quango and a talking shop and oh. what have you. Um, uh, you. You got it in one, Rob. You got it in one. I mean, the, the very last thing and the, the very first thing Roger and I and Alistair spoke about is exactly that. We absolutely do not want to be draped in ermine robe. This is not a quango. This is, we are not going to get drowned in that sort of nonsense. This is about growing things um, and bringing that sort of commercial, commercial eye to things. Uh, because, you know, uh, the last sort of thing I would want to join personally is some sort of um, quango-esque organization that's there for the sake of itself. Mm. Um, you know, my passion is, 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 is about growing things um, and, uh, and that's what we want to do with, uh, with the British watchmaking sector. I mean, I can, I can imagine something being very effective, you know, if, you, if you think about the size of the, of the watch industry in, in the UK, um, at, a, at a retail level, uh, you know, if you look at the Swiss import figures, you know, we are the fourth or fifth largest market in the world for uh, for watches, yeah, exactly. Local. Um, but the vast majority of the um, uh, the energy is coming from the retail side or from the you know local offices of, of the Swiss giants, the LVMHs, the Rolexes, the, the Swatch Groups, and what have you. I mean, is there is there a role for for those types of people to 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 join because they're also part of the they could be part of the solution, but they're also potentially part of the problem, which is if I go up to the Manchester, you know, British School of Watchmaking or the Birmingham University School, most of the people who are training there are going to, are going to end up in the service centre of one of the major watch brands rather than going on to design and make their own movements or even move, movement parts. So there's a sort of, there's a tension about this where, where it's very difficult to see how the how British watchmaking um, as an industry can go from where it is to, to much further. Well, that's, I suppose that's really what we're trying to do with the Alliance. We're trying to uh, promote these watch and clock makers who join us and um, to let the wider wor world know that we're here and we're different. That's a key thing. We are all different. And actually, it's been really interesting for me in the setting up with this and working with Mike and our um, other founders, so that so the the sort of um, early founders are um, Fears Watches, so Nicholas from Fears Watches, um, and then there's uh, Crispin Jones from Mr Jones Watches, and then Bob Bray from Sinclair Harding uh, Clocks. And um, uh, well, actually, interestingly, I mean Nicholas and um, well, the, the, those three founders, well, also Mike has come from outside of the watch world. You know, they all had different worlds before they, they got into watchmaking um, or clock making. And um, I think for me, that's, that's an interesting story in itself. You know, why were these people attracted to building watches and clocks? And that's something that we can talk about. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, talk about this really exciting resurgence in British watch and clock making. And it, it is so different, you know, I mean, you need to look at the, you know, once we publish all the watch and clock makers out there, you know, there's some wonderful watches being built in the UK, some wonderful clocks, all at different price points from 80 pounds up to, you know, over a hundred thousand pounds, you know, and lots of people in between. So I think what we're trying to do is just focus on British watchmaking being different. We can never compete with the Swiss or the Germans. We don't want to because we have something more unique to offer to people. And that's sort of the approach or that's sort of at the heart of the Alliance and what the, what we're going to try and communicate to the wider world. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of um, getting attention and, and the tension that you talk about, um, 
if we grow, I mean, back in 2002, when Vermont started, back in 2004, when we started, I mean, there was nothing. Yeah. Um, now there are 75 businesses. We'll know shortly through the Bellwether Report, a better, we'll have a better understanding of the scale of what's going on in British watches. Um, I think it will surprise some people at how big it's become and how quickly it's become that scale. And that's just the, the launching point, isn't it? I mean, if we double in mm. size in the next 10 years, then you're talking about a sector that's of some substance. Things of substance have their own attraction. Um, the tension with Switzerland, we, I don't think we see it all, Roger, do we? I mean, we, we, I mean no. you know, the, the fact is that they, they, have the, the, they, they are the masters of, of, of what they do. Um, there's going to be, there's enough space for all of us in this. Um, but why shouldn't British watch brands have a larger share of this market? We can see absolutely no reason whatsoever that that can't happen, but it does need a focus. It does need some attention um, and it does need some promotion. It can happen. It could happen as it has from the early uh, noughties to now with just individual brands doing their thing. But we just think that the alliance is one of the things that could help just supercharge it a little bit by bringing together a focus. And that, you know, it'll be up to, the, it's, it's not up to the alliance to grow the industry. But if we can act as a conduit, as I say, if we can act as a supercharger, if we can bring attention to something that is already growing, why can't it um, be another glass shoot? Why can't it um, double, treble, quadruple in size over the next 10, 15 years. There is no reason it can't. There is the expertise. There is the hunger as far as I can see. Um, so why can't it? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. And I think when you talk about this being a very good, good moment, I think it's actually a, it's a good moment for independence watchmaking in general on a, on a worldwide basis. We're starting to see you know, a lot of collectors getting into um, watchmakers who might only be making a dozen watches a year or up to a thousand watches yeah. a year. You know, we're seeing a lot of uh, increase in prices of those types of watches at the moment on the, on, in the auctions in the second secondary market. And I think it's because they can reach people via social media and you know, in much more inexpensive ways than used to be the case when they'd have to you know, buy a $100,000 advert in the front of the GQ or something. So they can get, you know, smaller companies can get momentum more easily today than was the case. We're seeing the likes of watches of Switzerland doing designers in residence. So they're actually supporting some of these. Well, I don't think they're supporting it out of altruism. I think they're supporting it because it's working, that, the, that people are interested in, in, in new stories, something new and interesting. So I think that's got, um, you know, if you, if you tie that together with the, the, whole logical history of the UK going going back two, three hundred years and the birth of Rolex in London and these types of stories, then um, you know, I definitely think there's plenty to say. Yeah, I think well we agree. And um, you know it is uh, it is uh, it, I, I just think it is an appetite moment. Um, and and I do think that the um, bless them the some of the Swiss brands um, you know are there to be picked off, frankly, some of those larger brands. I really do. I mean, I think um, people are looking for authenticity. They're looking for, um, you know, transparency increasingly. And, and we can, you know, many, many of the British brands are, you know, because they're of their independence, because of their, their, their sort of have an authenticity, because they're relatively new and young as well. Um, Whilst it can be seen as a um, as a negative, I mean, you know, the Swiss brands um, trade often on their, uh, their, their 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 heritage. Um, as you say, our heritage is, is is not necessarily in the current brands; it's just part of the backdrop of what makes uh, British watchmaking great. Um, the brands themselves tend to be pretty new, um, which I think is really exciting because you're able to be in touch with. with the people who started those brands. And that gives a different dialogue to that which you can have with a brand who's you know, um, founded in 1890, yeah. who's, who's just got a management team in charge of it. So 
you know, eventually we'd like to be the size of some of those, um, those, those Swiss watch brands, wouldn't we? But actually this, at this moment, you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a, you know, there's a kind of an anti big brand thing under uh, running through lots of, uh, lots of sectors. Um, and we've got as a British, uh, as a British sector, lots of really strong independent brands that can go and take advantage of that. So I, I, I agree with you, Rob. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I would say that there's, you know, there's nothing so threatening to huge conglomerates as there's small independence with hunger and being nimble and, um, you know, never say die, never say die attitude. So, yeah. um, and I think I am feeling some, you know, some, some flagging, flagging enthusiasm among those big um, conglomerates. So there is a, an opportunity, I think, for for more players but then you know the, the, the watch industry that been ever thus you know you, you it's you've seen this Dar darwinism over so, so many so many decades and um yeah why, why not the british well that's it why not um but it won't happen if we don't do something that's for sure um and and that's all the alliance is about really doing something we just wanted to to make something happen um and, and hopefully it will. Um, it won't be through lack of trying, anyway. <laughs> no. And Roger, and Roger, don't get to speak to you very often. How, how are things going? How's this year been? So, sorry, I didn't. I missed uh, that. Sorry. I'm just saying. Uh, how's this year been for you? It's um, yeah. I mean, it, it's been okay. It's been fine. You know. Um, you know, we've definitely noticed a lot more interest, as you were both just talking about then, you know, there's a lot more interest in what we're doing. And I think, um, you know, lockdown, although I know a lot of people struggled, um, you know, fortunately, we were having a lot of inquiries and people had, I think, had the time to explore what we're about and to realise that we are doing something very, very different, you know, outside of the uh, big brands. So, um yeah, it's been okay, and um, uh, we're still gradually growing and taking on extra people and so on. So, yes, touch wood, it'll uh, it'll carry on like that. But um, that, I mean, you know, that, you have, you know you, you say you're talking, you're making you know, 12, 13 watches a, a year, something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, does, does Mike sit down with you and say, you know, come on, Roger, you could be making five hundred watches a year, and you know, <laughs> how you do it. <laughs> We we've not had that conversation yet, have we, Mike? But, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, what we what we do, we do. I think we do very well. You know, at the moment we're making. I think this year we should do about fourteen pieces, and we're very happy with that. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I think Mike, who's you know many tens of thousands, that idea would terrify me. <laughs> so. Uh, so the idea of waking up every morning and sort of looking at those figures would scare me witless. But um, well, well, so no, I think we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, you're, we'll stick you're, to. You're incredibly modest, Roger. But um, <laughs> I mean, what what, what is, uh, is is for sure is that um, Britain is uh, is very lucky to have uh, someone like a Roger Smith uh, at the apex of its um, of its sector um, of watchmaking, um, and um, you know. It's uh, we we are at very different uh, very different ends of the uh, of the spectrum of watchmaking in many ways, um, but the values are very similar um, mm. that we hold about mm. trying, to, trying to do things. I mean, but uh, um, but you know what Roger does is is just um, I, I you know I'm constantly in awe of of of, of what they create um, because it is um, it is exquisite beyond exquisiteness. Um, yeah. And uh, we should be. Uh, I'm very proud that we've got um, Roger W. Smith <laughs> Limited in. in wow, well, I'm very embarrassed now, Mike. But um... I know you are. Oh, sorry, Roger. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's true, isn't it? It's, uh, there are very, there are but, very. But uh, actually, just just to come back at you on this, I mean, I think um, so. This idea of this alliance, you know, we've been thinking about it for many years now, and. Um, I used to bump into Mike at uh, Salon QP and we used to chat and so on. And the last Salon QP, which was two years ago, I think almost, yeah. Yeah. Um, we were having this conversation and I said, I think we need to do something. And Mike said, really? He said, well, 
I will if you will, sort of thing. <laughs> and that was music to my ears because the one thing that I couldn't do is what, you know, Mike is able to bring to the table. And, you know, we, we are at this moment in, in British watch and clock making where it needs a bigger picture. And Mike has many, many years of big business, big retail business. And he's brought completely fresh eyes to the British watch and clock making industry, which it so desperately needs because, um, you know, me making sort of 15, 14, 15 watches a year is fine, but that knowledge will not build an industry. And that's what I'm keen to see being done. So, um, yeah, just to throw that back at you, Mike. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, but I, do, I do think, that, and it is an important message that we want this to be um, uh, an alliance of all the talent and all yeah. the brands. And all the brands. Yeah. There are no, there are no uh, closed doors here. We want everybody in it, uh, yeah. involved. Um, so it really is an open door for everybody and anybody who's interested to join. Right. Uh, all right. Well, I can't promise to bring any talent to it, but I'll certainly be supporting you and uh, in any way I can. Well, thank wonderful. You, because it's also very important that that people like yourself do so. Because uh, as you know, you're you're a, you're one of those um, pinnacles of, of 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 communication for the industry. One of the one of the only ones, indeed, that uh, uh, that regularly communicates about what's going on. So to have your understanding and support is uh, is 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 valued very highly by us. So thank you for that. All right, great. Well, I wish you luck with it, and uh, yeah, hope to meet, meet you all. Um, the first, the first physical gathering, I'll be there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Many thanks, Rob. It's great to have you. Yeah. With support. Cheers, Rob. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye now. Bye. Bye.